Hello, Master of Gardener trainees. We are going to talk about turf grass today because this is one of the sessions we did not get a chance to discuss in uh, the class because we ran out of time. So let me share my screen with you and then we can go ahead and, and get started. So hopefully everybody is, share, is seeing the turf grass slides. So the first part of the turf grass presentation is talking about the different lawn grasses. We're going to identify the common lawn grass species and know the pros and cons of each species. Now here are the five Florida lawn grasses that can grow across Florida. However, centipede grass does not grow well in central or south Florida. That's primarily a grass for north Florida. So we are going to skip that when we talk about the different grasses. Uh, zoysia grass can grow here, um, but it can struggle a little bit because of our nematode issues. Um, but Bahia grass, St. Augustine grass, and Bermuda grass do well here in uh, South Florida. So let's first talk about Bahia grass. Bahia grass is the grass that you will see a lot of times, or mostly, or all the time, in um, pastures. It is the pasture grass. It's used for cows and horses. And they also use this grass along the roadsides. And they use it along the roadsides because it's very drought tolerant and uh, can take harsh conditions. This is the grass that you may see brown during a drought. But as soon as it starts raining, it greens up very, very quickly. So it's extremely drought tolerant, probably the most drought tolerant of all of our turf grasses. It also has low fertility needs. Uh, you don't have to fertilize it at all or even just a few times a year, um, but not more than one or two times a year because then it can, then it can be too much fertilizer for the turf grass. Uh, very low maintenance. It, can, it is the only turf grass that we can grow here in South Florida that establishes well from seed. Well, I won't say establishes well, but can establish from seed and it is tolerant of sandy and fertile soils. So you know why it does well here. But it does have its disadvantages. It can produce those prolific seed heads, uh, which can be unsightly for some. You'll see them popping a lot in the summertime. Um, they can be difficult to mow. It has an open growth, growth habit. Uh, so it's not tight, as tightly woven as your St. Augustine grass, which allows room for the weeds to sneak in and start growing. It also does have, it has poor wear and salt tolerance. So you can see from the bottom picture here, it does not do well with uh, being used for a driveway because the the compaction of the soil can can damage the grass and also it does not do well along the shoreline because it has low salt tolerance and it is susceptible to mole crickets and as you know the mole crickets i believe is the ugliest insect that we have here in florida the two varieties of bahia grass include argentina and pensacola argentina is the one that we're going to primarily use for lawn grasses uh, Pensacola is the one that they use primarily along the roadsides because it, it is um, very tolerant of stressful conditions. The next turf we're going to talk about is St. Augustine. Uh, we do have a whole EDIS publication on St. Augustine if you want to learn more about it. And with that said, there's also one on Bahia grass. The advantages of St. Augustine that there are some cultivars that are shade tolerant. It does have good salt tolerance, so it can do better along the shoreline than your uh, Bahia grass, and it can tolerate a wide range of soil pHs. Uh, we have very high soil pH here in uh, Martin County, and it can tolerate some of those high soil pHs, but it still has a limit if it gets too high. And this is uh, this turf grass does establish very quickly from sod. That's primarily how we grow the sod in our, our, our um, I should say, plant the sod in our homes and our, in our landscapes is by sod. It does not grow by seed. And it does have that deep green color, which a lot of homeowners like. The St. Augustine also has its disadvantages. It's not as drought tolerant as your Bahia grass. So even when we can, we can train our St. Augustine grass to be more drought tolerant, but even when we do that, it still needs regular irrigation during dry weather. 
it is very um, sensitive to chinch bug damage and also a number of diseases, which we'll, we will discuss. It has poor wear, cold, and drought tolerance, so it's not going to do well as a sports turf. It's also not going to do well in a park where there's a lot of, a lot of activity on it. It needs proper fertility to maintain its color and health, but we also need to be careful not to over-fertilize it because then that's going to lead to other problems. It does require um, weekly or even bi-weekly mowing, uh, sometimes twice a week, depending how fast it's growing. And it can form excessive thatch. Thatch is the layer of organic material that gathers between the soil surface and the top of the leaf blade. Sometimes you'll have that organic material build. And when you walk on the turf grass, it will feel spongy. You'll feel like you're bouncing. And that's a uh, indication that there is thatch. Here are the different varieties of St. Augustine grass. Um, it's kind of difficult to tell the difference between St. Augustine grass when you're just looking at it. Some people will come into the office and ask us what variety they have. And that's pretty much impossible unless it's bitter blue, uh, which kind of has this, this bluish color to it, as you can see on the third picture down. But other than that, it can be very difficult. I mean, it can be, it is impossible to tell the difference between the different cultivars. Uh, right now, um, probably 90% or more of the turf grass that's growing in Florida is the Floritam, the Floritam St. Augustine grass. Um, but now the University of Florida is recommending that homeowners replace Floritam with Citra Blue. And the reason they're doing that is because of the, of the lethal viral, viral necrosis disease, which we will talk about towards the end of this presentation. The next turf grass is zoysia grass. Uh, zoysia grass is popular because it has a thinner blade than your St. Augustine grass. And it also uh, has that tight knit look to it like the St. Augustine grass. So thinner leaf blade um, and a tight knit look. So the advantage is, is that it is dense, like I just mentioned, which can resist weed invasion. It can adapt to a wide range of soils. It has good shade, salt, and wear tolerance. Uh, zoysia grass is often used as a sports turf. You'll see that in some ball fields, and they also use it in golf courses also uh, in the rough areas of the golf course. The irrigation needs are similar to St. Augustine. If we allow zoysia grass to dry out, if we allow it to, to go into drought, it will turn brown. But once you apply water, it greens up pretty quickly. And um, most herbicides are safe to apply to the zoysia grass, but it does have its disadvantages. It does go dormant in the winter, which a lot of homeowners don't like. So it can turn brown like the turf grasses do up in the northern part of the country. Um, but once it starts to rain uh, and warm up, it can green up pretty quickly in the springtime. Um, it does have major pests, webworm, fall, fall, fall armyworm, and large patch disease is, uh, is uh, found often in zoysia grass. And this grass can also form thatch just like your St. Augustine grass. Um, again, it will turn brown quickly without irrigation, but can green up when irrigation is applied. And it is sensitive to uh, nematodes. And that's something we also need to remember um, because we could have nematodes here in Martin County. Here are some of the different cultivars of zoysia grass. You can see there is difference in the cultivars. Um, I am not skilled at telling the difference between them, um, but you can see that there's some that are more finely textured, like the Xeon and the Geo and Trinity that you would see on the picture on the right and those that are more coarse textured, like the empire zoysia grass, grass and zenith. Centipede does not grow in Martin County, so we're gonna skip through centipede, but it does grow uh, in the north part of Florida. It's just too warm here to grow uh, in, south, in central and south Florida, it does not grow. So I'm gonna skip through that to get to Bermuda grass. 
Uh, Bermuda grass is the grass that you see in golf courses. It's used in golf courses because it does not mind to be mowed very, very short. It forms a vigorous, dense turf. Sometimes you may see this as a weed in your landscape because it does. it is so vigorous. It's very fine textured. It's adapted to a wide range of soils and climates. It's very, it's very uh, wear uh, tolerant and drought tolerant and can establish very quickly. Disadvantages, it does not have any shade tolerance, so it needs full sun to grow. And uh, one of the main disadvantages as a homeowner turf is that it is high maintenance. It needs mowed frequently, it needs fertilized frequently, um, and it just take, it takes a lot more to manage than your St. Augustine grass. It does have poor pest tolerance. If it gets a pest, uh, the pest can take it out pretty quickly. Uh, and I did mention how it rapidly can invade your plant beds. And this one can also form thatch. I'm not gonna go over all of the varieties of Bermuda grass, um, but you'll have these in your handout. So you can, if you wanna learn more about them, you can read about them. There's a lot. So this is a nice chart that summarizes the Bahia, Bermuda, St. Augustine, Zoysia, and centipede grasses. Uh, you can see where they grow, even though it says centipede grows statewide, that's, that is not true. It doesn't grow in central and south Florida very well. And, it, and it's not just the climate, it's also that it needs acidic soils. And as you know, we do not have acidic soils here in Martin County. Uh, so the best choices for Martin County for a homeowner would be your Bahia and St. Augustine grass. Of course, St. Augustine is going to give you that tight knit uh, dark green appearance. Uh, Bahia grass is going to have a thinner leaf blade, um, but not as tight knit as your St. Augustine grass. If you like high maintenance, you could also go and plant some Bermuda grass, but you're going to be mowing that frequently to keep it under an inch tall. So here's the soil pH ranges for turf grass. As we mentioned, we have high soil pH here in Martin County. Our soil pH ranges probably in the high sixes to low sevens. I've even seen some pH come in at eight. Uh, so Bermuda grass will grow across the board and you can see St. Augustine can also grow uh, up to around eight. However, Bahia grass is gonna prefer to be on the, the mid six as a high range. Um, so when you're looking at this, if you have a high, C, high pH soil, the best grass that we can grow here in South Florida is going to be that St. Augustine grass or the Bermuda grass if you want high maintenance. Um, zoysia grass is going to be a little difficult to grow. Um, Paspalum does not grow well in Florida. And also ryegrass is an annual, so it only grows in the winter and fescue grass does not grow in Florida. So let's talk about lawn maintenance. So our objective for part two is to understand the Florida friendly lawn maintenance practices and become proficient, proficient in calculating lawn fertilizer amounts. So we've did, did fertilizer calculations uh, a month or two ago, um, so that, but this is gonna be a good review for you. And it is important to men mention that, that lawns, turf grasses are Florida friendly when they are managed in a Florida-friendly way and used in a Florida-friendly way. So shade is shade can be a factor when selecting your turf grass. St. Augustine, there are some cultivars that are shade tolerant, but even the shade tolerant St. Augustine grasses do need at least four hours of sun every day. So if you go to plant those St. Augustine shade loving turf grasses like the Del Mar, make sure that you still have four hours of sun. It's not gonna grow in the deep, dark shade uh, underneath the oak trees. Um, there's people, that, homeowners that like to keep replacing the turf grass in shady locations, and that's just the fight that they're never going to win. So of those St. Augustine ones, I said Del Mar, I meant Seville. I don't know where I got with Del Mar. Um, you can see these are the shade tolerant from the most to the least. And Citra Blue, we mentioned Citra Blue earlier as being tolerant to the lethal viral necrosis disease. 
Um, so that's great that it's also shade tolerant, but look at the bottom of the list. The bottom of the list is the Floritan. Floritan, which is 90% of the St. Augustine grass that we use here in Florida, and that's the least tolerant of shade. Uh, so that's very important to remember that Floritan St. Augustine, which is the St. Augustine that you're most likely going to get when you go to the big box stores, is not shade tolerant. If you do have turf grass in shade, so talking about some of those shade tolerant turf grasses that are planted in shade, we need to treat them a little differently because the conditions are different than the turf grass that's in the full sun. We wanna make sure that we try to reduce the shade. Uh, we can trim our trees, but we do not want to lion tail them to get the sun in. Uh, reduce our traffic in the shaded areas, um, reduce irrigation because the turf grass in the shade is not drying out as fast as the turf grass in the sun. So we don't want to add too much water because as we know that can lead to disease. We also, we don't want to fertilize as much. The shade in the turf grass is not growing as quickly as the shade in, as the turf grass in the sun. So it's not using as much fertilizer. And we also want to try to mow as high as possible in those areas. Uh, we want to keep the leaf blades long so there's more shoot tissue for the plants to photosynthesize. Let's talk about irrigation. Uh, Overwatering is an issue. Uh, we see it happen, happen a lot in, with homeowners. When we overwater our turf grass, that can increase disease issues. It can cause the take-all root rot. It can stunt the growth. It can cause a weak turf stand, which means that your turf is not growing healthy. And also we can have an increase of increased weeds because the weeds sometimes seem to love the water when our turf grass does not. And one weed, one weed that is a water loving weed that you will find in your turf grass is dollar weed. Dollar weed is an aquatic weed. And when you see dollar weed growing in turf grass, it is a sign that it's being overwatered or there is a drainage issue that the soil is holding too much water to allow this weed to grow. So how often do we water? You guys had the irrigation training, so you know how much to water, but it really depends on our, uh, on our location in Florida. Here in South Florida, we are gonna be watering uh, more than if we lived in central or north Florida, just because our grass actively grows almost the entire year. Uh, we will need to water when it's hotter and drier out versus when it's rainier and cooler out. Um, our shade soil type can, can have an effect on watering. Of course, sandy soils, we need to water more because our sandy soils do not hold water well. Uh, we just talked about in the shade, you wanna decrease watering. We're going to try to water appropriately so we can get nice deep roots, which we'll talk about in a second. And also understand that when we overwater, that can cause pests such as nematodes and diseases. We also need to make sure that we understand our water restrictions um, from either our city, county, or water management district on how often we can water with automatic underground irrigation. So we can actually train our turf grass to require less water. And to do this, we wanna encourage the turf grass to grow deep roots. When they have deep extensive roots, they have more access to the water deeper down into the soil. So by, by watering when only when our lawn needs water, we can increase the roots because the roots are gonna dig down looking for water when we allow our turf grass to go in slight drought. So we're not gonna have our turf grass go completely in drought, but when it first shows sign of drought, that's when we're going to water. So this is not a set it and forget it type of irrigation. This is, this is paying close attention to your turf grass. So when your St. Augustine grass or your turf grass turns a bluish gray color, kind of has that hue when you look across the turf, that's a sign, that's a first sign of drought. When the leaf blades start folding in a half, like you see in the photo here, you can see the leaf blades are starting to fold half in half. That's the first sign uh, that it's going into drought. And if you walk on the turf grass and your footprints remain behind you, meaning that the turf, 
grass, the turf blades do not have that turgor that they used to where they bounce up right away, that's also a first sign of drought. So this is when, when you start seeing these signs, this is when you're gonna water. And by allowing your turf grass to go in a little bit of drought, it's gonna encourage a deeper, more intense root system. So this is a chart we just talked about with drought tolerance. As you can see, Bahia and Bermuda are gonna be the most drought tolerance, but St. Augustine does also has good drought tolerance and we can train it to be even better by doing by only watering as needed. So when we water, we want to only apply one half to three quarters inch of water when the turf shows sign of the that will. We don't want to water less than that, and we don't want to water more than that. Uh, if we water more than that, that's just a waste of water. If we water less than that, that's not going to go down deep enough for the roots that have started to dig deep into the soil. So we wanna make sure that we water one half to three quarters inch of water, and that's gonna go, that water's gonna flow deep enough into the soil uh, for the turf grass. We're gonna make sure we calibrate our irrigation system so we know how much water to apply at one time. So we do this by placing uh, cans, such as tuna cans or cat food cans around our lawn and turning on our irrigation system for a period of time, say 15 minutes. And then you take an average of the water that you collected. If you are applying a half inch to three quarters of inch in 15 minutes, then you know you only have to run your irrigation system for 15 minutes. But if you're only getting a quarter inch of water in 15 minutes, then you know you need to water your keep your irrigation on for at least 30 minutes to get a half an inch. So uh, the quantity uh, per application uh, does not vary. We always want to apply one half to three quarters inch, but the frequency that we apply that water does vary because we only want to water when we first see signs of drought. We don't want to water uh, when we get significant rainfall and we don't wanna water past the point of runoff where you just, the water, the soil's so saturated that you just see sheets of water coming off of that, that, that lawn. And I'm sure everybody has seen that before around town. So this is the photo that I've been trying to explain to you this whole time. So when we do short frequent irrigation events where we aren't putting one quarter to three quarters inch of water and we're watering a lot, the, the roots have no reason to grow, go deeper because get, they're getting all the water they need right there at the surface. But when we allow our turf grass to go into drought and only water when needed, when it's showing those first signs of drought that we mentioned, it's going to encourage a deeper root system because those roots are gonna dig deeper looking for that water. And that's what we want. If we had water restrictions and they told us to shut off our water and we couldn't water our lawn anymore, which turf grass do you think is going to uh, do better in a drought situation without irrigation? Of course, the one on the right, the one with the deeper root system. The one on the left is going to die pretty quickly without irrigation system because it does not have that root system. So the best time to water is between 4 and 10 a.m. The reason why we want to water so early is because that's when there's less sunlight out so the sun can dry out up a lot of the rain through evaporation and we also don't want to water earlier than that because then our turf grass is going or the water is going to remain on our turf grass overnight and that can lead to disease so watering between four and ten o'clock in the morning is the best for our turf health We talked about, or Yvette talked about the rain shutoff device. Make sure you have a functioning rain shutoff device. If you don't know if it's functioning, turn on your irrigation then take a hose over top of the rain shutoff device and see if your irrigation turns off. Um, it's only gonna turn off when you collect the amount of water that you set it to, which should be half inch to three quarters inch. So if you only get a quarter inch of rain your irrigation system is not going to shut off because that was enough, not enough water for, um, for your turf grass at one time. You also may want to make sure that your sprinkler systems are aligned, make sure they aren't broken, broken and they're applying the right amount of water. So with watering in, sum in summary, make sure that you have fewer longer irrigation events to apply that one half to three quarters inch of water and only water when your turf grass needs it. Do not water in the evening and make sure you maintain your uh, efficient irrigation system. 
So let's next talk about mowing. So we saw this picture with irrigation, but it also correlates with the mowing height. A lot of our turf grass is mowed too short here in Florida, and it's mowed too short usually by a company, a, a mow and blow company that comes and mow the turf grass. Um, the reason we, why we want to make sure we maintain the proper height of our uh, leaf blades on our turf, because that also encourages a deeper root system. For the turf grass that's mowed very short, like you see the one on the left, there is no reason for that turf grass to grow a deeper root system because it does not have the leaf blades to support a deeper root system. But if you look at the one on the right, those longer leaf blades, when mowed appropriately at the, pro the proper height, um, that turf grass actually is encouraged to grow a deeper root system because it has more leaves that leaf surface that it needs to support. Your St. Augustine grass should be mowed between three and a half and four inches tall for the leaf blades. And this includes your Floritam and it also includes uh, your Bitter Blue and, and the dwarf cultivars like Citra Blue can be mowed a little shorter to two to two and a half inches. Bahia grass likes to be mowed at three to four inches tall uh, and Zoysia grass less than two inch tall and Bermuda grass less about a one, in, one inch or less tall. Always mow at the highest recommended height for your species. If you allow your turf grass to become, to become too overgrown, to grow too tall, just like with shrubs, if possible, do not remove more than a third of the leaf blade at any one time, because that can damage the turf. Uh, we can end up scalping it if we take off too much at one time. So that's important why regular mowings uh, is recommended. We need to mow regularly so we don't have to remove more than a third of the leaf blade at one time. We actually want to encourage our homeowners to keep their grass clippings on the lawn. We don't want to bag them and we definitely don't want to keep uh, blow them into the street, into the sidewalk or down the storm drain because that will be, that's a pollution issue. But by recycling the clippings on the grass, they will break down very quickly and actually add nutrients, especially nitrogen to the turf grass. And by doing so throughout the year, you can, you can actually eliminate one fertilization because you're going to have enough nitrogen just from the, the clippings being recycled on the turf. And this is really important in the summertime when uh, with our uh, blockout dates for fertilization that happens June through September, um, you're going to get nitrogen by allowing your grass clippings on the turf. So make sure you allow them uh, to degrade right there on your turf grass. If we have any environmental stress like shade or drought, try to increase the height. And we also um, don't wanna mow wet grass because uh, wet grass, you're gonna get that clumping of the grass blades and then you're not gonna have, you're gonna have to collect that or somehow blow it apart or it's not good to, to mow wet grass. And always keep your leaf, your blower, your mower blade sharp, just like we keep our pruning tools sharp. Same with your mower. You don't want the mower to tear the leaf blade. You want it to cut a nice clean cut of the leaf. So then you'll have a healthier turf. You won't have that, that torn look on your turf grass and see all those rugged edges of the, tur of the leaf blade when you look across the, the turf. So we wanna make sure we prevent scalping. Scalping can injure our turf, and this is a, can especially occur in our St. Augustine grass. If you haven't noticed, St. Augustine grass has the rhizomes above the soil. Um, so if we scalp, we can cut those and damage our turf grass. Next, we're going to talk about fertilizer for our turf. Uh, so this will be a little bit of a review. Uh, you know about the macro and micronutrients. So the primary nutrients for turf grass are going to be our nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and iron and manganese. They're going to get the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen from the air. So lawns do need nutrients to grow and remain healthy. And we're mostly going to be concerned about our nitrogen and phosphorus. These need to especially be applied correctly and appropriately because when misapplied, these two nutrients can impair our water resources. 
So the two ways these, uh, how nitrogen and phosphorus can cause harm is it can leach through our soil. So if we apply too much fertilizer to the surface of our soil, it can actually leach downward. If we apply too much, the plant will take up what it needs. But if we apply more than it needs, the excess fertilizer is going to go down through our soil and into our groundwater, into our aquifer. Um, we can also, it can also pollute by running off of the turf grass. Um, if we accidentally spill fertilizer on the sidewalk, on the road, or if we apply right before a huge rain event, it could run off and go straight down through the storm drain to impede our waters. So the best time to fertilize is when the grass is actively growing, which is in the warmer months. But as you know, we do have fertilizer blackout dates uh, from June 1st through September 30th uh, in Martin County. And if you live in Sioux Point, then you, your end at uh, the city of Stewart, your, your fertilizer ban is extended through the end of November, which is unfortunate because this is the time that our grass needs the fertilizer. And science has showed when we apply fertilizer to a healthy turf grass that is actively growing and we apply the fertilizer at the appropriate rate and the right type of fertilizer, which includes a slow release fertilizer, the grass is gonna utilize all that fertilizer or at least 99% of that fertilizer. Um, it's when we impro improperly apply it, like we apply it before a heavy rainstorm or we apply too much, is when you have the pollution issues. But when we apply our fertilizer in the in the fall and the winter months, our turf grass is not as actively growing, so it's not gonna utilize that fertilizer as quickly. And there's actually more chance of having leaching and runoff events uh, in the winter because we don't have that actively growing turf grass. But we are, uh, we must follow the fertilizer ban. So when fertilizing uh, around the ban, I recommend fertilizing at the end of May, which is coming up very quickly because that's gonna give you the fertilizer that the, the plant needs um, at the end of summer or at the beginning of summer when it's actively growing. Make sure that you, when you mow that you leave your grass clippings on the turf grass so you get some extra nitrogen during the summer months until you can fertilize again. And as soon as you can fertilize again uh, in October, on October 1st, uh, do so. Uh, Cause that fertilizer, that, that turf grass is be very, very, very hungry and in need of those nutrients. So we do want to fertilize one to four times a year. This depends on your grass species. So the best time, again, this is just everything that I mentioned. Um, in the summertime, if, if you, since we do have the ban and we can't apply nitrogen and phosphorus, we still, are allowed to apply iron. Iron will green up your turf grass and it's not considered a pollutant. So you can apply iron uh, to your grass in the summertime for that extra green up. Uh, in the fall, uh, potassium, which is the last number in the fertilizer bag is important. So when we fertilize with our fall fertilization in October, the beginning of October, make sure you have some, uh, some potassium in that fertilizer. Um, in the winter, like I said, the grass is not as actively grown, growing um, but we can, um, if we fertilize in October, I'd say we can wait until uh, the end of January to fertilize again. It does say South Florida may fertilize year round, but if we use a slow release fertilizer, we probably don't need to fertilize until uh, January anyway. So make sure you check with your municipality on your fertilizer bans. So how many square feet are we fertilizing? You need to do some rough estimation. Uh, remember our fertilizer bags are gonna give us a recommend recommendation for every thousand square feet. So we need to calculate how many thousand square feet that we have in our lawn. And you guys remember how to do this. We need to calculate how much the percentage of slow release nitrogen that we have. If you remember, we take our percentage of slow release nitrogen, which is going to be in that fine print on the back of the bag. So, um, and then you divide that by the total nitrogen, which is the first number on the fertilizer bag. So for example, if we have 15,015, 
That's 15% nitrogen, 0% phosphorus, 15% potassium. Uh, and it says that it's a 6% slow release nitrogen when we read that fine print. Uh, we take six divided by 15 and we get 0 0.40, which is 40% slow release nitrogen, which indicates that that is a slow release nitrogen source. Remember anything over 30% is considered slow release nitrogen. So we will apply it at a rate of one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Basically just follow the directions on your fertilizer label. Once you once you know how much is a thousand square feet, it's gonna tell you how much pounds of fertilizer to apply so you can get that one pound of nitrogen. It's not one pound of the total fertilizer, it's one pound of the nitrogen. So um, your fertilizer bag will help you with that. If the slow release nitrogen is below 30%, First of all, I don't re recommend using any fertilizer that is below 30%, um, but it, if it is considered a quick release product, then you are only gonna apply half a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet because uh, applying too much nitrogen at a slow release nitrogen source can cause uh, pollution. So how much fertilizer? So this is, this is, uh, will help you. If you read your fertilizer bag, that's going to tell you too. But if you actually want to do the calculations yourself, you can do that. It's pretty simple. So again, we're with our 15, 0, 15, take a hundred divided by 15. And that's going to tell you how many pounds of the actual fertilizer that you need per thousand square feet. So you still need to calculate how much thousand square feet. So if you have a fertilizer that's over 30% slow release nitrogen, which is like the 15015, and you do that calculations, you're gonna apply six and a half pounds of that fertilizer for every thousand square feet in your yard. And that's gonna be one pound of nit equal out to be one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. If it's a it's a quick release product, then you take that amount and divide it in half. So if this was a quick release fertilizer, which I hope you aren't applying to your turf grass, then you would only use three and a half pound or three and a quarter pounds. Um, per thousand square feet. So this talks about how much we fertilize. We see with our bahia grass, only one to four times. Like I mentioned, one to two times usually is enough for bahia grass. Um, Bermuda grass takes the most. It's the highest maintenance and it takes more mowing. It takes more fertilizer, um, five to seven times. So you're almost applying that every other month, uh, which can be impossible because we don't, we have the fertilizer ban. So you need to figure out when to fertilize uh, your Bermuda grass. But St. Augustine, which most of you have, we're going to fertilize four to six times. Um, if you can get four times of fertilizer in a year with a fertilizer ban, I don't know if that's possible. Um, so I recommend fertilizing uh, at least three times a year. I recommend fertilizing at the beginning of October and then at the end of January and then again in May. Um, and then make sure that you mow your grass and leave your grass blades on your turf grass in the summertime so it can get that nitrogen. So we wanna make sure we evenly apply fertilizer. So you're gonna take that 6.6 .6 pounds of fertilizer from the calculation we did previously for, and then you, you know how much a thousand square feet is in your yard. And then you're going to apply it at a slow rate, one direction, and then press cross in the in the other direction. So use half the amount one direction and then half the amount the remaining direction. And this is so you can get even coverage and you don't end up with a striped field, which happens often when there's uneven fertilization. If you do spill the fertilizer, make sure that you sweep it up so it does not pollute. And also the same goes with grass clippings. Think of grass clippings as a fertilizer, as a pollutant. Make sure you blow that back up onto the grass or sweep it up. Do not allow it to go into the storm drains because all storm drains go to the next body of water, which in our case is the lagoon and the ocean. So the best management practices for fertilizer is to make sure we properly fertilize a healthy lawn. We don't want to fertilize dirt. Make sure it's a healthy lawn. Um, apply the correct amount of fertilizer. More is not better because it's it can burn your grass, but more importantly, it can pollute our water bodies. Um, do not fertilize around water bodies. Make sure that you keep keep a ten foot halo around the water bodies so the fertilizer doesn't go into the water. 
Um, you can do a soil pH so you know what nutrients you currently have in your soil. And remember that we naturally have high phosphorus in our soil. And since phosphorus is considered a pollutant, we do not need to add any more phosphorus. So that middle number should be below five or even a zero uh, when we're choosing a fertilizer. Only fertilize when your turf is actively growing, not when it's dormant. And we wanna make sure we irrigate with about a quarter inch of water after we fertilize. That's gonna get those fertilizer pellets, the fertilizer pellets off the leaf blades and down into the soil. Uh, if you just resodded, do not fertilize newly planted grass for 30 to 60 days because it does not have the root system yet to absorb that fertilizer. And that fertilizer is just going to leach down into the aquifer. So we need to make sure we only fertilize grass that has been planted for at least 30 to 60 days. And as always, keep your fertilizer off your driveway, sidewalks, and patios. All right, let's talk, next talk about pest management. We're gonna recognize some of the common pests and diseases that are with lawn grasses and describe how to manage weeds. We learned a lot about weeds, so that might be a quick review for you. And also we're gonna talk about integrated pest management. So we have biotic and abiotic stresses. Biotic is gonna be an insect disease, nematode or weed. And then the abiotic are things that usually the environment or we do to our turf grass. So there's no living factor to it. And that include drought, overwatering, uh, excess or insufficient fertilization, uh, mowing, scalping, or using dull blades, um, having soil issues, temperature extremes, shade traffic, dog spots, AKA puppy urine that can, the high nitrogen can kill your turf grass. Um, standing water submersion can, can cause a lot of root rot, and then also uh, high salts or saline water can cause issues on our turf grass. So some of the turf pests, there's a, a lot of insects, including caterpillars, beetles, crickets, uh, mealybugs, and scale. And there's also a lot of diseases that can be a problem. Uh, we have nematodes and weeds that can also be issues in our turf grass. Let's talk about some of the caterpillars. Uh, this is the tropical sod webworm and also the fall armyworm on the lower pictures. Uh, they're active uh, year round, but they're usually most active uh, during the summer, April through November. The tropical sudworm has the gray green color to it and the light brown head. If you look at the head of the top picture, you can see it's light brown versus the fall armyworm, which is on the lower picture has a dark brown head. Um, we treat these the same so we can, we can put a BT product down because uh, they are a webworm. BT will kill these, uh, these worms. Um, uh, so we don't have to specifically identify them, but what they do is they're caterpillars. So they're gonna chew leaves into your turf grass. Like you can see that top picture where they're chewing the leaf, the sides of the leaf blade. On the fall armory worm, I should mention, also has that Y on its top of its head, so head if you really want to uh, identify it. Here's some more of the damage you can see when they're young, they'll just skeletonize it like the picture on the le top left. Um, they will pupate into the soil. You'll see, you'll see um, webs on your lawn and more than just spider webs because you'll have spider webs also. Um, but if you look closely, you'll see the notching in your leaf blades. That's when you know you have this, the tropical sod webworm or the, the, um, the fall webworm in your lawn when you see that notching. So you have more than just the webs. Uh, spider webs are, are good in your lawn. Uh, webworm webs are bad. They love all grasses. They especially love highly maintained ones, especially those that are over fertilized because that yummy new growth they're gonna be chewing on. There's some enemies out there. You can see here's a predatory stink bug. If you remember, the predatory stink bug has these little thorns on its shoulder, and that indicates that it's predatory, plus it's eating a caterpillar, which um, can be a sign that it's predatory. Um, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, that we use on caterpillars will kill the webworms, and also um, conserve is another chemical that you can use on the, on the webworms. BT is a, a botanical and organic. You might see spittle bugs. I don't see these too often, but you'll see them now and then. If it looks like somebody spit all over your lawn or in certain parts of your lawn, that could be the spittle bugs. The top photo is the adult. Um, and then in that mass of 
spit or foam is the young nymphs and they're in there damaging your turf grass. They're an occasional pest. You don't see them too often. You, usually North Florida will see them more than we see them down here, but they, they suck the juices out of the, the leaf blade causing it to yellow and turn brown. It's often associated with with uh, turf that has excessive thatch. Grubs could be a problem. Our scarab beetles, uh, when they're, Im they're, the immatures are grubs and they will tunnel through the turf roots, damaging the roots and also feeding on, on the grass roots. And they cause it to yellow. It only takes seven grubs per square feet to cause damage. So you'll see them, you'll see them in there. If you see a few here and there, that's not going to cause a lot of damage. But if you have five to seven per square foot, then that's when you're going to, that's going to be an issue to your turf grass. Uh, there's a lot of different scarab beetles that can cause damage. You can see there's a few here pictured. Chinch bugs, chinch bugs are going to be a pest of St. Augustine grass only. They're teeny tiny. Um, they're, the immatures are red and then the mature ones are black with, it looks like they have an X on their back from when their wings cross. And they are going to suck the plant sap out of the turf grass, causing the leaf blades to brown, like you see in the photo here. And they typically like uh, dry areas, I should mention too. Uh, you can see that there are some other insects that look very similar to the chinch bug. So you have the chinch bug on the left, then you have the false chinch bug on the right. Yeah, it, it that the one on, or I mean, in the middle, the one in the middle is harmless, but it looks a lot like a chinch bug. Um, but you can see it has a, its eyes are a little wider, um, and its wings uh, can be a little longer. And then you have the big-eyed bug. The big-eyed bug has really big eyes, but it has black wings. Uh, not white wings. So that's one way to tell the difference. And the big eyed bug actually is going to be feeding on the chinch bugs. So you may see them also. You can also have a hunting bill bugs. I, uh, these can be an issue. Uh, also it's another, it's a weevil. You can see it's a beetle with a nose. So it's, it's a weevil. Um, and it can, it's larva can actually bore through the stems of the turf grass. Um, zoysia grass and Bermuda grass are its preferred hosts. Oh, there's our lovely, ugly mole crickets. <laughs> uh, these uh, mole crickets like Bahia grass and Bermuda grass, they can also be on centipede grass and they consume the plant, not just the roots, but also the, the, the shoots and the leaves. And they uh, typically are a problem in August is when the young Mole crickets are underground doing all the damage. By the time we see the adults later on that month or into September, the damage has already been, been done. There they are. You have the short winged, the tawny and the Southern uh, mole crickets. All equally ugly. And then we have scale insects and mealybugs that can be on turf. I don't see it too often, but just know that it's, it's can be a problem. You have the, the turtle meal, mealy bug, which you see in that top photo, a Bermuda grass scale that's like Bermuda grass. That's on the, the second to the top photo. You have another mealy bug, um, which is uh, you can see on that third photo and ground pearls, uh, which is a type of a scale insect. Um, on the bottom picture, you can see, see one there. These are primarily pests of zoysia grass and Bermuda grass. They're piercing sucking insects. So, you know, they suck the juices out of the leaves and they're really hard to see because they're so tiny. We only see them when we start to see the damage. So of course we want to minimize our pest problems with integrated pest management or IPM. Uh, a lot of these pests love overwatering and they also love nitrogen. So when we apply too much nitrogen or we use a soluble for, form of nitrogen, that's when the, the pests seem to move in. We want to make sure we mow our grass at the correct height because we don't want to induce any extra stresses on our or on our turf, and we want to minimize thatch. Um, so take a look every time you mow. When you're mowing, look for look for pests. If you don't mow your lawn, maybe once a week, go out there and see if you see how what how your pest is looking. You can monitor it with soap flushes, um, and I'll show you that in the next slide. When needed, spot treat with uh, insecticides and make sure that you use um, products that can help protect our beneficials.
and as always rotate our modes of actions to avoid pest resistance. This is especially important with chinch bugs. Chinch bugs tend to build up resistance pretty quickly. So here's a video of a soap flush. So usually you would have a bucket um, or a can, I mean, and take out both ends of the can and put that about an inch or two in the soil, then add soapy water. And then you'll see the, the um, any insects that might be there float to the top. But you can also just put it in an area that you suspect insects and just, just watch closely and you might see something when they add that soap water. Soap water and then the soap water forces the insect to come. It's, oh, there it is, there's a mole cricket. The soap, he couldn't breathe anymore, so he's forced to come to the surface. Let's watch that again. Soapy water, there's the mole cricket. Um, for chinch bugs, which are a lot smaller than the mole crickets, you would, it's best to use that, uh, a can, a tin can that you would take out both ends and put that down into the, the soil where you suspect chinch bugs and add that soapy water. So let's move on to turf diseases. This is a huge issue, especially with a new disease that we have in South Florida, which we'll talk about. So the first one, uh, well, as you know, fungi is the most common disease pathogen. Remember, 85% of all the diseases out there are fungi. Uh, the first one is gray leaf spot. This is very, very common. I see this a lot on turf grass. It typically doesn't cause the too much damage. You might see some thinning of the turf, um, but just as it sounds, gray leaf spot, you're gonna get these gray leaf spots on the leaf blades. Uh, then you have large patch. Large patch, or um, sometimes called brown patch, occurs November through May in cooler temperatures. And you'll see from the photo there, the St. Augustine grass just rots off of the, the base of the roots. And you have a, a kind of a rotten smell to it. And this is usually due to too much fertilizer, too much nitrogen and too much water being applied to the turf grass. Uh, and that will induce the large patch disease. Um, you can spread this by mowing too. Take all root rot. This is a sad one because it does kill the turf grass and there, um, there's rarely any control for it. Uh, all photo lawn grasses are susceptible. Again, excess water and nitrogen can accelerate this disease. So too much water, too much nitrogen, areas of flooding um, that can occur often also occurs where there's nematodes and high pH problems, but we see this on occasion. And basically you can identify this because if you look at the root system there, it's basically gone. There's no extra feeder roots. Those roots that are there are rotted. If we took our fingers to it and tried to peel away that first layer of the root, um, it will just come off very easily. But this is the one that we're concerned about the most. This is lethal viral necrosis of St. Augustine grass. It used to be called the sugarcane vir virus, um, but lethal viral necrosis is what it's called now. It's definitely in Martin County, it's, uh, and it's definitely in Palm Beach County. I don't know how it skipped St. Lucie, but I, I have a feeling that's also in St. Lucie County. But if you look at the turf grass, you can see that translucent yellow striping that occurs. The most common effect cultivar of St. Augustine grass is Floritam. But wait, 90% of the St. Augustine grass that we have in Florida is Floritam. That is correct. So it is has a smorgasbord of turf grass, the Floritam St. Augustine to feed on. Remember we talked about not planting all the same cultivars of plants? Well, we planted way too much Floritam and now unfortunately a lot of our Floritam, St. Augustine Floritam lawns are being destroyed by this disease. Um, palmetto, bitter blue, and also citra blue, which is not on the side, but citra blue are the recommended varieties that are more resistant. Because it's a virus, we can't control it with a chemical. And so it just kills our turf grass pretty quickly. Next, we're gonna talk about weeds. Um, weeds love water, fertilizer, thinner bare areas, when we mow our grass is too short and we need to make sure we scout our lawn to keep them out because you know weeds can fill up pretty quickly. This is a review for you guys. You guys know the difference between broadleaf grass and sedge, weed, sedge weeds. Uh, remember broadleaf has veins that um, do not go parallel. They have netted veins and broadleafs. Grasses have parallel veins and then sedges have edges. 
So we talked all about this with weeds. We have the pre-emergence herbicides you're gonna put down before the weeds germinate. And we have the post-emergence herbicides that we apply after the weeds have sprouted. Some are most common weeds, uh, Bermuda grass, which we use as a lot of our sports turf can be a weed. Crab grass is a huge weed and also torpedo grass. If you haven't heard about torpedo grass, that's a huge weed, not only in our turf grass, but also in our landscape beds. So it's really hard to control weeds because grassy weeds, because grass weeds are related to our, our St. Augustine or our Bahia grass or our uh, Bermuda grass. Um, there's no chemical that can tell the difference between our, our monocot desired turf grass and the monocots weed grasses. So we want to make sure that we reduce our weed intrusion by having proper fertilization and proper mowing. Make sure we mow at the right height, make sure we don't over fertilize, but also fertilize the right amounts. Uh, make sure we irrigate properly and also make sure the turf can actually grow in the site that we're putting it at. So we're going to skip over that activity. And with that, if you have any questions, make sure that you ask me. Um, send me an email if you have any questions about turf grass. And with that, I thank you for listening.